Hello everyone and welcome to the ninth episode of Cycling Research Review. And in today's episode, we ask the question, what can we learn about studying 15 cyclists in the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands? Now, since this paper was written in 2013, they've actually built the Daphne Schiffersbrug, which is a new bridge that's only for uh, pedestrians and cyclists that run on the roof of a primary school. You've probably seen pictures um, of it. And, uh, and that now provides the, the connection between these two neighborhoods. So it's, it's kind of interesting to, to kind of roll back the clock a bit and, and see what the situation was back in 2013 when they were actually building a, a new railway bridge connection and to see how the situation now differs and have changed uh, to the present day. So in this paper, uh, the authors really explore this idea of senscapes as it relates to cycling. Uh, they actually do this and study in a very qualitative manner. Uh, and their methodology is uh, to recruit 15 participants um, doing a ride along and to use uh, both video and also GPS to record uh, what happens during the route. So the re researcher goes along with the study participant. And from this, we get some very unconventional data points. So instead of uh, simplifying each uh, aspects of the experience and trying to aggregate it, uh, quantitatively. What we've done here is I see direct quotations being used uh, from each of the participants. So, so they're able to really add depth into what a uh, cycling experience is, especially in the context of the Netherlands. And they talk about how the city is interpreted differently between urban planners and the people who experience the city on bike. So when we think of urban planning, it's usually in terms of a top-down map, in terms of political boundaries, in terms of infrastructural boundaries. So we think highways, railroads, rivers, uh, and, and where does the, the city border ends. But um, what this paper by Van Dupen and Spearings presents to us is a very different idea of borders itself. So how people experience going from home to workplace and where along that route they, do they experience boundaries. It could be in the form of a bridge. It could be in the form of uh, the smell of a coffee shop. It could be a familiar street. And one participant here even uh, denotes a intersection as a, a final border between uh, being on the way to work and finally getting to work. So. All right, traffic engineers use lights as a device to maintain the choreography of the intersection, but it could also be a space for waiting. It could also be a space for uh, people thinking about their day or, or just using it as a boundary to be like, this is the last red light we have to get to before we get to work. So I'll take a quote from the paper. Uh, they talk about participants and how their experiences. And they say, many participants spoke about switching mentally between home and work during the journey. They often related a specific part of the trajectory with being occupied with, what do I need to do at work today? Or with going into evening mode after work. Cycling helped them digest the day after about 15 minutes of physical activity to clear their mind. Others have pointed out this as a place to think and as a space to plan the day. So people are really making use of this active commuting time uh, to serve a, a, a mind clearing function. They also illustrate the more physical ways that uh, cyclists kind of use the city and are creative with the infrastructure and the surroundings given to them. They make uh, creative use through detours or unsanctioned shortcuts through the grass, for example. And they also negotiate with other cyclists. Um, so for example, uh, one of the, the people interviewed said that they sometimes are forced to run red lights because if you don't run a red light, then the other cyclists would run into you from behind. So uh, to maintain the flow, you, you're sometimes even forced to break the rules. And they touch briefly on the idea of route choice, which is how people pick which road they go on. Uh, and here they illustrate uh, with two pictures, uh, top and bottom. So the top one you see is a very residential, uh, quiet route. And then the bottom one is what the city has designated as, uh, as uh, the main cycle route. 
And as you can see, it's, they're two very different cycling experiences. And here, uh, even the participants bring in, I'll refer back, unpack the idea of urban design and how that can contribute to building better cycling environments, is that here, the participants themselves even mention ideas of how uh, they're enclosed within a space. Uh, about how a space is quieter, about how uh, the different elements of urban design and not just the infrastructure also serve to make their route more pleasant. So it turns out that the cyclist experience of the city and the neighborhood boundaries are in fact shaped by audio, visual, kinesthetic, and even their, their, their sense of smell, right? And, uh, and Von Dupen and Spearman writes, Commuting trajectory is divided and connected in multiple ways, transcending the planner's priority to overcome infrastructure lines as main dividers of the neighborhood and the city in Utrecht. This is not to say that the constructed bridge over the canal or the tunnel encapsulating the motorway cannot smoothen connections and create a more compact city. However, such an approach seems to forget about the already existing connections and to marginalize the other divisions of importance. By quantitatively exploring the individual experience of cycling, now we see uh, this being an extension of perhaps the idea that Kevin Krajic and, and Anne Forseth presented in their paper, you know, is there a distinctive view from the bicycle? So now the researchers here have actually uh, went and taken this view from the bicycle, from the researcher's perspective, but also from the participant's perspective, um, and explored how everyday commuters take this view from the bicycle. And it, it seems here that, that there's, there's quite a dis clear distinction here between uh, the view of, of drivers and also pedestrians in the city, and how that's distinct from uh, things that cyclists pick up on. For example, um, when they talk about uh, cresting up a hill onto the bridge, I find that interesting because uh, you don't feel it the same way in a, a non-wheeled mode. So when you're walking, it, it's actually not a very steep uh, grade up the bridge. And when you're driving, you just uh, kind of step on the gas and it doesn't bother you. So this is a kinesthetic experience. And in other ways, because you're also moving faster, the scenery changes at a much faster rate. And for example, this passing through the smell of coffee, that happens relatively quicker on the bicycle as compared to walking where that moment would drag on for much longer. I do wonder if it is possible to, or desirable to capture these experiences uh, perhaps quantitatively. So how do we translate these perspectives from the cyclists into ideas on how to build our cities. For example, we've been able to capture or models the dislike that people have for hills. But how do we then cap recapture that uh, sense of exhilaration that some of these participants mentioned when coming down the other end of the hill? And some of them mentioned climbing this hill as a, as a weekly challenge, something that, well, not if they don't look forward to, but as giving them a sense of accomplishment. How do you capture in our utility models of uh, the smell of co the coffee shop, for example, or this feeling of getting to work, or this feeling of arriving home after a long commute? So I think this paper serves to illustrate the diverse dimensions of experience that we have while cycling, and how it's not simply positive or negative, and it's not simply fitted into uh, a model. So whereas we have uh, time distance, uh, you know, time waiting at a traffic light, we can even have hills, uh, weather in the model, it is hard to capture these things like a smell of coffee or I, I mentioned here the cheeriness of a yellow bridge. So perhaps after reading this paper, I do think there is a larger role for urban designers to play in the design of uh, cities that cater to cycling. And I think this is a case because a lot of these um, things that people have mentioned in this paper are in fact unique and, uh, and very specific to their specific uh, commute situation. So um, it's, it's, not, it's not that these urban design elements can be exactly replicated. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe having unique landmarks, uh, unique smells, uh, unique gradients are all factors that contribute to what makes cycling so special. 
But it is also clear here that the authors acknowledge that this is in a context where, where cycling is very normal. So uh, social problems like the stigmatization of cycling or, or how people see themselves in relation to society as a marginalized group doesn't really apply uh, here in the Dutch context. So where are the biggest insights that we can gain from this study? Well, the authors mentioned two points. One is that the boundaries of what urban planners think are there on a map don't exactly match up with how uh, each individual person experiences the city. So there's actually many different boundaries uh, according to who you are and what your interaction and what your business and what your movement patterns around the cities are. And number two is that I think it's uh, a very complicated issue on how do we turn the variety of experiences. Um, this was just 15 people. So if you can imagine uh, an interview is 30, 50, 100 people, it, we would get ever more diversity in how people experience the city. So how do we turn that diversity into a useful conclusion? And the conclusion is perhaps to illustrate that there is this diversity. There is this depth of experience that is not being captured in the current traffic-based model of how we do things. That uh, the smell of coffee is unique, that if you see a yellow bridge or a, a, an intersection, it's, it's more than just a physical structure. It, all of these things come together to have meaning. And meaning is created by slices of a journey. So we, we take these moments uh, in time and we piece them together and then we call that a trip. And finally, it's to reconceptualize this idea of cycling skills. What does it mean to be an experienced cyclist? For example, if you know all of the shortcuts in your neighborhood, does that mean you have a lot of experience of a cyclist? Um, or if you know how to choose the best routes that suit what you want uh, from your commute that particular day, does that mean you have a lot of experience as a cyclist? We tend to think of experience as purely the physical, as being able to navigate through a chaos of traffic. But if that chaos of traffic doesn't really exist there, and the chaos we're dealing with is really other cyclists and uh, other pedestrians, then um, these other navigational skills become much more important. It becomes a matter of how do you find your favorite route? and how do you interpret your own landscape? And how do you create the best journey uh, from home to work to the grocery store using the urban layout that you have? So these all raise very interesting questions that uh, I hope are thought provoking for urban planners and also urban designers alike. And we'll keep building on this theme, this theme of experience and how the senscape contributes to everyone's journey of the, si uh, of the city uh, coming up in these next episodes. So thank you for joining me for episode nine of Cycling Research Review, and I will see you next Tuesday. Hit the subscribe button below if you want to hear more from me next week, and I'll see you then.